hopefully. I'll hand over to Marion. Are we okay to go? Over to you, Marion. Thank you very much. And um, good evening to everybody. Uh, we seem to have lots and lots of people coming in, which is wonderful. Um, thank you for, for joining us. I know that one or two of you at least have tested positive for COVID. So isn't it wonderful that we have Zoom and we can actually get together in any case. So um, welcome to this Pax Christie Scotland event to mark the 40th anniversary of the Scottish Bishop's statement condemning the possession and use of nuclear weapons. I'm Marion Pallister and as chair of Pax Christi Scotland, I'm so pleased to welcome so many of you at this difficult time and uh, to have with us two such powerful speakers as Archbishop William Nolan and Dan Daniel Hoogstar. I think I've probably got that wrong, but I did take lessons before we opened up this evening. Uh, the war in Ukraine and the threats that nuclear weapons could be used has reminded us of the vital importance of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. In force since January 2021, um, Nuclear weapons are, of course, still stored on the River Clyde. And we have to remember that despite our protest, Scotland is a reluctant nuclear host country and therefore perhaps a nuclear target. So with that sobering thought in mind, may we begin the evening with a short reflection and prayer from our Pax Christi Scotland chaplain, Father John Convery. Over to you, Father John. Thank you, Marion, and good evening, everybody, and welcome from wherever we are joining from. You're more than welcome in this evening of reflection. I'd like to begin our reflection this evening by quoting a very often used piece of scripture, and it's taken from the book of Isaiah. In the last days, the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be set over the highest mountains and shall tower over the hills. All the nations shall stream to it, saying, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. For the teaching comes from Zion. And from Jerusalem, the word of Yahweh. He will rule over the nations and settle disputes for many people. They will, be, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not raise sword against nation. They will train for war no more. O nation of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of Yahweh. Who would have thought in 1982, when the bishops of Scotland sat down to write their statement on the eradication of weapons of mass destruction, that you would be sat here this evening and in just the space of a few short weeks, one leader of, the, of a nuclear power has already threatened to use nuclear weapons only 20 years after this statement. I read you the opening, the very opening sentence of the Bishop's statement. This Easter, we call upon all men and women to work for genuine peace in the world. We have at present an atmosphere of uneasy peace in which a nuclear holocaust remains an ever-present threat. Can we, 
who proclaim Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace, remain unperturbed at the frightening arms race of the superpowers? Are we prepared to risk the future of our world by gambling for peace with a nuclear deterrent? Yet while we share the moral dread and the deep perplexity of this choice, there are no facile solutions in sight. I have listened with much interest to debate and dialogue on our television screens and on newspapers, people debating, people dialoguing, people arguing over the complexities of the use or the impending use of chemical weapons or indeed nuclear weapons. In 2022, as we sit, most of us probably here this evening in our comfortable chairs, in our Zoom meeting, we reflect on the reality of those who flee, as Marion said in the opening, those who flee for refuge from Ukraine. Can we ever even imagine what the men, women and children at the end of these weapons are going through at the moment? Probably, I speak for myself, I find it's my struggle and my comfort. I find that difficult. But nevertheless, we are called, as Isaiah called us, to beat our swords into plowshares and to build peace wherever we may find ourselves in solidarity with those who suffer the, suffer the violence of war. Who would have thought in 1982 and that prophetic statement from the bishops of Scotland that we would indeed be gathered here this evening with the distinct possibility that such weapons may be used. So I'd like to ask you to invite you in a moment of silence before we begin our reflections this evening to reflect upon the victims of war, to think of them, to pray for them, to reflect also and to pray for those who inflict violence and the insanity of war, that somehow God may touch all those people's hearts and bring his peace. So before our discussions, let's pause for a moment and remember the victims of war. O God, who dwells beyond all our names for you, we pray for the will to be at peace with one another. We remember this day those who find themselves thrust into war. We pray for light in the darkness and hope amid despair. We pray for peace in ourselves. Help us to breathe in peace. Help us to breathe out love. Help us to know and accept ourselves as your beloved. We pray for peace in our families. Help us to speak the truth to one another in love. Help us to respect and value one another. Let there be peace in our communities. Help us to create a peace born of justice and equity. Help us to honour and serve the common good. Let there be peace among our nations. Sustain our hope. Grant us wisdom. Empower us with courage. Let there be peace in our world. Help us to love the earth as our mother. Help us to see other nations 
as our neighbours. Help us to wage peace. Let there be peace, O God, for those in need, for those who are frightened, for those who have been displaced, for those who are ill, for those who need work. Let there be peace, O God, for all of us who are tempted to give in to fear and despair. Let there be peace in our time. And let it begin with us. Amen. Thank you so much, Father John, for concentrating our minds so movingly. I would now like to introduce Archbishop William Nolan. He doesn't really need any introduction to for most of you. Uh, recently appointed as Archbishop of Glasgow after being Bishop of the Diocese of Galloway since 2014, which coincidentally was the year that Russia invaded Crimea. He's been outspoken, incredibly outspoken, on the issue of nu nuclear weapons. And as President of the Scottish Bishops' Conference on Justice and Peace, he has used his voice in national and international arenas to echo not only that 1982 pronouncement by the Scottish bishops, but Pope Francis's increasingly strong condemnation of nuclear weapons. We have stood together at Fast Lane. Now I'm honored to invite him to reflect on that momentous declaration. Archbishop Nolan, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Marion, for that introduction. and. Uh... Good evening, everyone. It's really, I'm delighted I should be taking part in this. Um, when I mention to people the anniversary of, of this statement, uh, 40th anniversary, uh, some people who weren't too concerned about nuclear weapons thought, well, this is a bit out of date, this statement. But in actual fact, when you read it, as John did, even the very first line shows how unout of date, sadly, it is. And uh, I think the, the statement uh, has some pertinent points that we really need to look at. We want to look at, at why, why we still got nuclear weapons um, and how can we move forward in order to get rid of these weapons. And uh, I think that, that comes down really to, to the central issue that we see on, on this statement. Um, the popes have always condemned the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, they've been very consistent on that, right from uh, Pope John the 23rd, and uh, uh, he, he condemned it. Um, and, and Vatican II, um, Gerdim Spes, uh, condemned the indiscriminate use of uh, weapons of mass destruction. So, and every, every poor ever since has, has condemned the use of these, these weapons. But significantly, what happened in 1982 in the, in the uh, pastoral letter from the bishops, well, they went a little bit further. So perhaps you can move on, Callum, to the next slide, please. Yeah, the, 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 the Scottish bishops um, mentioned that if it's immoral to use these weapons, it's also immoral to threaten their use. Now, that questions the whole idea of deterrence. And I would hold that the reason why we still have nuclear weapons today is because so many people are convinced by deterrence. Uh, they've, they've accepted the arguments of, of deterrence. And uh, unless we persuade them otherwise, then we're never going to persuade people to get rid of these weapons. Um, those of us who have been involved um, in the kind of campaign to get rid of nuclear weapons, we're all convinced that they're wrong, we're all convinced we should get rid of them, but um, we have to convince others uh, that are not active in that campaign that if it's immoral to use these weapons, it's also immoral to threaten their use. And that's where uh, the difficulty lies. Everybody, it says they're not going to use these weapons. It's great. Everyone thinks, well, we have to have these weapons uh, so that we don't have to use them. It's an interesting kind of argument. Um, but that's the argument that, that you get. And people feel we can't get rid of these weapons because we do need them. Otherwise, we'll be under, under threat. Now, when the, the Scottish bishops made their statement in 1982, they really were sticking their heads above the parapet because no one else had made that statement. And 
in actual fact, it was not particularly well received. Maybe it was well received in the uh, nuclear examiner circles, but it wasn't well received elsewhere in the church. And, uh, uh, and south of the border, for instance, some of the English bishops thought that uh, the Scots maybe were, had, uh, had written this after having had a few drams too many. Um, uh, and everyone waiting to see what the Vatican would make of this. Uh, were they persuaded by the um, arguments of, of the Scottish bishops? Well, we didn't have to wait too long for that to happen. Do you want to move on to the next slide now, Callum? Um, just a couple of months, uh, June of that same year, um, Pope John Paul II went to the United Nations and addressed the United Nations. And while Pope John Paul II is against nuclear weapons and and indeed, I spoke often uh, against nuclear weapons. It's what he said about deterrence. He said that in the current conditions, uh, deterrence based on violence certainly not an end in itself, but as a step on the way towards a progressive development may still be judged morally acceptable. So forget all the, the blurb in the middle uh, because all everyone ever concentrates on is the fact that he says deterrence may still be judged morally acceptable. And so the, the, the rug was pulled from under the feet um, of, the, of the Scottish bishops. People thought they'd gone far too far in what they had said, and the church was not ready to kind of take that step. Now, in fairness to, to Pope John Paul II, um, you know, there was progress being made uh, in the 1980s. Um, the uh, nuclear powers, in particular America and, and Russia, they were in dialogue. Uh, and there were various agreements coming, uh, reducing the number of nuclear weapons. But he, and he was persuaded that, that was a kind of temporary thing. But of course, it just gave a moral justification uh, to deterrence. Um, and um, the, event, the, the no other bishops conference um, took the same line as the Scottish bishops. So I think we really have to look at deterrence. Um, if you ask people, you know, why why they accept uh, nuclear weapons. You know, the, the arguments are that deterrence keeps the peace. Um, they'll say that, there's been peace in Europe for 70 years, well, obviously not now, but, um, uh, and, that, and, and that nuclear weapons have kept the peace. Um, now, and also you get people ans uh, uh, saying things like they, you know, it, it, gives, it, it gives them a sense of security. Um, I was at a conference in, in the Vatican um, a few years ago, I think it was 2000, 17, um, and um, you know this um, um, Israeli representative got up and said how the fact that her country nuclear weapons made her um, feel more comfortable so she could sleep at night. Um, I was also sitting beside a Palestinian <laughs> who didn't think that the fact that Israel had nuclear weapons helped him sleep at night. But it does give people that sense of security. We've got these weapons and we feel secure because we've got these weapons. Um, and of course, whenever you argue um, that we should get rid of our weapons, then immediately you can be sure that uh, the media, some of the media uh, will, will immediately um, have headlines saying, this is absolutely madness. You know, we're going to leave the country undefended against the threat of Russia. So, and these, these are arguments that people accept. So we can't just dismiss them, but we have to address those arguments. Otherwise we don't get anywhere. We don't make any progress and we just keep, uh, convincing ourselves by, by our own statements. We don't convince anyone else. Uh, I'm always shocked by how quickly and how easily um, the, uh, the, the Trident and the Trident replacement um, is approved by, by Parliament um, in, down in Westminster um, by vast majorities. Um, it, it's really, you know, it, it's sad that there's no, um, there doesn't seem to be any hesitation there about spending billions of pounds on, on nuclear weapons. Um, so that shows you how ingrained uh, this is. There's one other thing, which I think is also in the background of this, um, which is never really mentioned, uh, certainly not by, by governments. But I think that, um, you know, the fact that you're a nuclear power gives you membership of the club, a status, a status in that, you know, uh, the big five nuclear powers, you know, all dominate the, the United Nations. And um, I think from certainly from the I think from the UK perspective, you know, we still haven't got used to the fact that we're not, you know, we're not an empire anymore. The British Empire is gone and we still want to see ourselves as being a, a bigger and more important country than we actually have. And the fact that we've got nuclear weapons, we're a nuclear power, I think, adds to that. And so um, 
I think um, you know that 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 is also in the background of this. Now, um, how can we how can we address um, these arguments that people have in favour of nuclear weapons that they that, that, that they just accept and take for granted? They're so kind of ingrained as being obvious to people. Um, it's very difficult. I don't necessarily know that I've got the answer. Uh, the answer to that. Um, but interestingly, if you want to move on to the next slide, Carl, please. When we get to 2005, um, this is a statement made um, by the uh, Pope's ambassador to United Nations in 2005 on the 4th of May. Um, this is just a couple of weeks after Pope Benedict becomes Pope. And here you'll get Pope Benedict saying that the Holy See has never countenanced nuclear cells as a permanent measure, nor does it today when it is evident the nuclear deterrence drives the development of our newer nuclear arms, thus preventing genuine nuclear disarmament. So here, finally, in 2005, we've got the Pope um, arguing against deterrence because deterrence is creating a new arms race. And of course, we've seen that. Um, Pope Benedict, um, his ambassador, is talking at a time when all the nuclear powers were starting to say, well, we need to upgrade, because if you have nuclear deterrence, if you have nuclear weapons, then you've got to make sure they're working. Um, and you've got to make sure that you've got the, the, the best uh, that there is so you can uh, counteract uh, your opponent. So that means continual development of ever newer nuclear arms. And so there's been a, a new nuclear arms race um, over the past couple of decades. And of course, Britain has been very much involved in that in upgrading Trident. So there's a bit of progress then. Uh, finally, 23 years after uh, the Scottish Bishop's statement, um, Pope Benedict comes out and says, no, deterrence is not acceptable and is driving an arms race. Uh, so there's one argument against deterrence. It is driving an arms race. And we can also argue that deterrence does not stop wars. Um, you know, deterrence did not stop uh, Russia um, um, going into Georgia or being involved in Chechnya. It didn't stop Russia taking over uh, the Crimea. It didn't stop Russia um, going, into, going into Syria. Um, and it didn't stop Russia either now uh, uh, attacking the rest of Ukraine. Um, it's a bit of a fallacy to say that uh, nuclear weapons have kept the peace for the last uh, 70 years, um, because during the Cold War, Really what you had was um, fighting by proxy. Obviously, America and, uh, and Russia weren't fighting each other directly, but in other com conflicts throughout the world, they were, they were fighting each other. And you can even see that today, perhaps in, in Ukraine, um, NATO has not put any kind of uh, manpower or personnel um, on the ground in the Ukraine, but it's supplying arms and uh, um, and those arms are certainly having their, their effect. Uh, so there's a kind of almost like a kind of proxy war taking place in the Ukraine as well. So nuclear deterrence has not stopped war, and it certainly hasn't stopped uh, this war um, in, in, in Ukraine. And there are people who now argue, of course, oh, we now have to up our, our nuclear weapons there because of this. <laughs> you know, this, this is not, um, you know, nuclear weapons are not, not stopping war. So we can certainly argue, argue against that. And also, we can also say that, you know, nuclear weapons do not actually bring security. They actually cause insecurity in the world. We've now got India and Pakistan who have both got nuclear weapons. And of course, that's because if one gets it, then the other has to have it. Because you immediately feel, um, you know, so we've got um, Israel with nuclear weapons, um, um, but we're not allowing Iran to have nuclear weapons. But if you were in Iran, you'd feel a bit insecure. Uh, of course, initially you'd feel insecure if Iran had nuclear weapons. Um, and nuclear weapons create an insecurity. Um, if you don't have them, then you've got to get them. And that's, of course, one argument. People say, well, you know, others, have, Russia's got it, so therefore we've got to get it. So, um, you know, disarmament is, is really the only way forward for everyone to get rid of their arms. And then they're not around, and then they can't be threatened to people. And then you can't have somebody escalate a conflict and bring in nuclear arms. Now, Another argument, which has the, the every pope has, has argued against, right from John the Twenty Third, is how much money 
nuclear weapons cost. And the amount of money put into those nuclear weapons actually um, is money that could be spent on peace building, money that could be spent on trying to um, uh, bring about the, 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 new, the UN goals for development, um, feeding the poor and bringing water to, to those um, who, who don't have, have clean drinking water. There's, but there's money that you're spending. There's, they, they say there's something like um, over $70 billion annually being spent on nuclear weapons worldwide. That's a vast sum of money that's been spent on a weapon that's there so that we don't have to use it. And in the UK, we're spending about four billion a year on nuclear arms as well. Um, which of course was the, the amount that they took out of the, the foreign aid budget just um, uh, the other year as well. So um, to, instead of using this money uh, for good, uh, we're using it and it's a vast amount of money it's a vast amount of, of human resources as well. Um, you know, there are obviously some very talented and clever people involved in maintaining these uh, missiles and so on. What a shame that all their expertise is not being used to build up the world and do something positive in the world instead of just to keep developing this uh, nuclear arsenal which we have. And um, Pope Francis um, has been... Uh, very uh, vocal on, on nuclear weapons. And one of the things that he has said is that you know, people are dying today because of nuclear weapons. And that's because the money being spent on them is not being spent on the poor. So that brings me to, to my uh, final slide, um, which is Pope Francis. Uh, there, just back in November 2019, he visited Hiroshima and he said, the use of atomic energy for purposes of war is immoral, just as the possessing of nuclear weapons is immoral. Pope Francis is, is quite clear, um, and I've heard him say it, that to produce nuclear weapons, to possess nuclear weapons, to threaten nuclear weapons, to use nuclear weapons is immoral. So 40 years on, um, uh, what has been achieved, well, certainly within the church itself, um, the arguments against nuclear weapons and against deterrence um, have strengthened. So that it's not just um, some Scottish bishops um, having a few drams too many, uh, popping their head above the parapet and saying, you know, the deterrence is wrong. Now we have the Pope saying deterrence is wrong. So that's progress, but it's taken that amount of time uh, in the church with a lot of goodwill. Um, how we proceed in society. I don't know. Um, we, we have a, a lot of work still to do because the whole philosophy of deterrence is ingrained in our society. So um, I'll leave you with that slide. I think that's a, a positive um, um, development uh, what Pope Francis has said, and he certainly has been very, very outspoken. And, uh, and hopefully, as we made progress in the church, we'll make progress in the rest of the world. So over to you, Marion. Thank you so much, Archbishop Nolan. Um, and let's thank those bishops of um, 40 years ago for, for sticking their heads above the parapet. I hope that you'll continue to stick your head above the parapet, along with all of us who are trying to rid the world of these weapons. As always, you give us so much food for thought. But now let's have a, a look towards the future and see what we can do about all of this. I'm turning now to Daniel Hergster. Daniel is campaign coordinator of ICANN. That's the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. He's responsible for the ICANN Cities Appeal, the ICANN Parliamentary Pledge, as well as supporting the campaign activities and political engagements of ICANN's partner organisations, of which we as Pax Christi Scotland are one. In the period that culminated in the ne negotiations of the Treaty uh, on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, Daniel coordinated advocacy efforts for ICANN and was responsible for generating awareness, understanding and support among governments to the 
uh, humanitarian initi initiative and for the concept of a new treaty to ban nuclear weapons. During the new negotiation of the TPNW in New York in 2017, he helped to lead ICANN's lobbying team to ensure the treaty reflected ICANN's core principles. Since 2018, Daniel's work has focused on supporting the work of ICANN's partners to gain political support for the treaty in what are called nuclear umbrella state contexts, as well as on broadening the community of stakeholders that champion the TPNW. He has degrees in political science and law from the University of Michigan uh, at Ann Arbor, Arbor and at the University of Edinburgh, uh, respectfully, respectively. So he's no stranger to Scotland. Um, we welcome him here and he is hopefully going to advise us today on the way forward for Scotland. Daniel, over to you. Thank you so much, Marion. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, thank you so much um, for having me here and, and for letting me say, say a few words. Uh, really appreciated um, uh, the, the poignant words from Father John, uh, as well as the, the remarks from uh, Archbishop Nolan. I really appreciate the description of, of the Catholic Church's position on deterrence. I recall very well uh, the denunciation of deterrence at the uh, that from Pope Francis, which was read out at the 2014 Humanitarian Impacts Conference in in Vienna, uh, which was I think really a big moment um, for the humanitarian initiative process. It really kind of added a lot of impetus and a lot of gravity um, to the proceedings, and and it really kind of change the way it was it was described really so um and of course i have no doubt that the uh, scottish bishop statement and their advocacy led paved the way for that for that change on on, on deterrence and certainly it did uh, resonate more broadly and and I, and I think uh if that's what can be achieved by a few drams then then i'd say it wasn't a few drams too many it was just the right amount of of, of drams um so thank you for that. And I also really appreciated what you said, Archbishop, about the how nuclear weapons breed uh, insecurity. I think that's really uh, kind of the, the core of, of the issue and, and the important and the, the real thing that drives us to an understanding that drives us to kind of challenge deterrence uh, in the public. And I think that's what we're trying to do with the, with the TPNW and advocacy uh, around it. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the language uh, of nuclear weapons uh, and how they're framed, uh, which I hope will dovetail with uh, the Archbishop's uh, excellent remarks. And then I'll talk about the treaty and uh, and what, what can be done uh, around it and some of the different advocacy tools that ICANN uses. Uh, but I want to talk about the, the language of nuclear weapons because I think it is one of the ways uh, in which deterrence is allowed to kind of hang there kind of un, unchallenged in the way it's just just able to so many people accept it and the media uh, accepts it as well no nuclear armed state uh, boasts of having weapons of, of mass destruction you know they don't say we're, we're proud to have these weapons of mass destruction most are even reluctant to refer to their nuclear weapons they prefer terms such as deterrent of course strategic deterrent or deterrent forces this is goes across the board for all nine nuclear weapon states it's not just you know some of them um, weapons that were that are much more powerful than those that were dropped on Hiroshima and, and, and Nagasaki are described as non-strategic these days or low yield weapons. Nuclear attacks on cities are not called nuclear attacks on cities; they're called counter value targeting in the academic circles. Initiating actual nuclear warfare can sometimes be described as escalating to de-escalate. Our adversary uses nuclear weapons to threaten or coerce, whereas we use them to deter. And nuclear threats are all also issued in, in kind of perversely coy or, or kind of poetically dramatic terms, like Putin saying, consequences you have never seen in your history, or Trump saying, fire and fury. So threats and threats to use nuclear weapons are often vague or, or veiled, and many and, and, and may be intentionally ambiguous with the aim of creating uncertainty among adversaries. They're rarely specific and never go beyond the decision to quote, press the button. 
um, the consequences should the nuclear threat actually be carried out are never explored or discussed and, and neither are any follow up actions uh, discussed and this is often true in, in when you when you read about these kind of nuclear war games that uh, that nuclear weapon states the militaries practice the nuclear war games end at the point when <laughs> the, when nuclear weapons are fired they don't talk about how to deal with the the aftermath how to you know respond to the humanitarian catastrophe yet any of course any actual use of nuclear weapons would have catastrophic and wide-ranging consequences especially in den densely populated regions so even so-called tactical or battlefield nuclear weapons of the kind that some speculate might be used in the ukraine conflict typically have explosive yields in the range of 20 to 200 kilotons. In comparison, the, the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945, killing 140,000 people, had a yield of just 15 kilotons. A single nuclear detonation would likely kill hundreds of thousands of civilians and injure many more, and the radioactive fallout could contaminate large areas, including in the country uh, that used the weapon. Widespread panic would trigger mass movements of people and severe economic destruction, again, possibly including the country that used, that used the weapon. And multiple detonations would, of course, be, be much worse. Nuclear, re nuclear weapons rhetoric often involves contradiction and, and inconsistency. And these are rarely questions, especially in the midst of a crisis. Nuclear armed states, and in particular, the five nuclear weapon states that are recognized uh, by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, China, France, Russia, the UK, and the USA, uh, are bound by international law, their own political commitments, their, and their national laws, policies, and doctrines. This is sometimes wildly at odds with the statements and actions of these countries. It's often forgotten, for example, that the NPT obliges these five countries to pursue nuclear disarmament. And in the context of this treaty, the five countries have given an, quote, unequivocal undertaking to accomplish the total elimination of their arsenals and have made commi commitments to diminish the role and significance of nuclear weapons in all military and security concepts, doctrines, and policies. Nuclear, nuclear weapons rhetoric is also replete with, with double standards and kind of special pleading. Several nuclear armed states condemned Russia's threats to use nuclear weapons while maintaining a policy that is legitimate to threaten to use nuclear weapons. Nuclear armed states typically claim that their own weapons are essential for security, stability, and peace, while those of their rivals are threatening, destabilizing, and dangerous. And we're seeing that right now, of course. Curiously, the security and stability arguments used by the nuclear armed states to justify their retention of nuclear weapons do not apply to non-nuclear weapon states, which might be considered acquiring them. Nuclear proliferation is regarded as a grave threat to international security. Nuclear armed states simult simultaneously claim to be committed to nuclear disarmament while insisting that nuclear weapons are essential for their own security. So this framing um, around the security dimension that a minority of states attributes to these weapons has been, it's been going, along, going on for, for decades. Uh, the, the debate around nuclear weapons, um, despite the, the horror they generated when used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, despite the evidence that we know about the, the 2000 plus tests uh, that were conducted since 1945, the debate around nuclear weapons is, is that they are you know, instruments of power, conferring a status to the countries that have them, bringing them security. So as a result, Although a lot of important mechanisms for arms control have been put in place, and we've seen a reduction in the number of nuclear weapons in the existence since, in existence since the end of the Cold War, not much has been achieved towards actual disarmament or the abolition of nuclear weapons. But, uh, of course, uh, since 2010, uh, there has been this growing attention to the humanitarian environmental impact of nuclear weapons. Of course, the advocacy has been going on uh, for much longer. But at the NPT 2010 review conference, there was this phrase uh, in the outcome document that referred to the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. And from that, a kind of movement uh, grew um, to raise attention to the humanitarian environmental impact, the risk they pose, and their lack of conformity to international humanitarian human rights and environmental law. And the three and the conclusions that, that came out of that are first, that the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons is so uh, horrific that there can be no legal, no ethical, no moral justification to use or threaten to use them or even to possess them. Second, as long as they exist, they pose a threat to the whole of humanity. And third, that the only way to ensure that they are never used uh, is to abolish them. 
So once you focus on the threat that nuclear weapons pose, and 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 not just uh, those who have them, but but the whole of but to the whole of humanity, everyone has a stake and a role to pay, role to play. The debate on nuclear weapons became one that nobody no longer is perceived as an issue of the Cold War, but a matter that had to be urgently uh, addressed. And by changing the terms of the debate, the humanitarian initiative opened a space for civil society to mobilize and act at the community, the national, the regional and global levels. Uh, it, it allowed the, the galvanization and the, and the commitment and activism, not just disarmament activists and, and, um, and others who are, you've worked on this for, dec for decades, but also youth, uh, religious leaders, aid workers, doctors, scientists, trade unions, members of parliament, cities officials, and more. And of course, many of these groups have been involved for a long time. But the humanitarian initiative allowed entry points for many, many more people to, to enter the community. So through the humanitarian initiative, we've been able to reclaim the international agenda to prohibit and stigmatize nuclear weapons. In light of the fact that nuclear weapons are everyone's problem, there's a humanitarian imperative to abolish them before they abolish us, uh, that democracy has to come to disarmament from the haves and the have nots to one country, one vote. Uh, an initiative channeled cooperation among civil society, among like-minded governments and the International Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, which pushed forward a diplomatic process that led to the negotiation and the adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Of course, the nuclear weapon states themselves refused to participate, but the major overwhelming majority of, of governments, 135, in all decided to go ahead and negotiate the treaty in 2017. And as, as Marion said, it entered into force in January of last year now has 59 ratifications and 86 signatures. I think it's it's important to for all of us, even if we're very familiar with with the TPNW, to to recall why why it's so important. I mean, prior to the treaty's adoption, nuclear weapons were the only weapon of mass destruction not subject to a compre comprehensive ban, despite their catastrophic, widespread, and persistent humanitarian and environmental consequences. The new agreement fills a significant gap in international law uh, in that sense. So in a nutshell, the TPNW uh, changed the way, uh, changed the legal uh, status, it filled this legal gap, but it also provided a huge opportunity um, to, to civil society and, and, and governments to kind of take, reclaim the initiative for it. It's groundbreaking in many ways, uh, the process uh, and, the, and, the, and the treaty itself, um, its scope, its vision, including the way it recognizes the, uh, the, the groups that are uniquely affected by nuclear weapons, such as indigenous communities, uh, women, and it also encourages their participation in nuclear disarmament discussions. It recognizes the need for victim assistance and environmental remediation. The, where, We've actually, with this meeting takes place, it's a good time because last Friday was actually when the new dates um, for the meeting of states parties were announced. Uh, as you probably have followed, the the meeting of states parties has been postponed a couple of times, as has the NPT review conference. Um, but now we know that the new uh, the new dates are going to be uh, the 21st to the 23rd uh, of June in Vienna, of course, and it's hosted um, jointly by the United Nations and the government of Austria. Um, the day immediately before, uh, there will be a humanitarian conference, uh, Austria, which is which is organized by Austria, um, and it's kind of to remind all the participants and, and the world watching uh, the real motivation behind this treaty, why it's why it's uh, why it's taking place and why it's why it's so urgently needed. Of course, um, I can, as the civil society coordinator, uh, we want to make this, you know, with the help of, well, with the help of all of you, uh, as big and a momentous a moment um, as possible. Um, obviously, as as uh, speakers before me have noted, that it comes at an incredibly um, scary and and difficult time, uh, and I think it's important. Um, you know, we shouldn't spread panic or, or engage in needless speculation about how a nuclear weapons ex escalation could take place as a result of the war, but we have to be honest uh, that nuclear weapons are a part of this and they compound the crisis um, in, in many ways. And so the response from the international community and from governments who are serious uh, about nuclear disarmament you know, has to be concrete and that involves participating at a UN conference that is that you know aims to eliminate uh, this threat. 
And so as I can, we're encouraging all states, of course, to sign and ratify. But of course, it's also important that states um, participate, even if they are not able to sign and ratify yet. And that's why we're calling on governments to observe the treaty as well uh, as an indication of, of support for the aims of the treaty as well. We're also encouraging um, members of parliament, and I want to acknowledge the uh, incredible support from Scottish parliamentarians, from uh, members of the Scottish parliament uh, who have been, I think, almost unanimous uh, in their support for, uh, for the treaty and who, uh, who have announced that they will be participating um, at the MSP, uh, at the Meeting of States Parties, and also participating at a parliamentary conference that ICANN is, uh, is holding uh, immediately before. The Scottish parliamentarians are um, a member, uh, there are members of, uh, many of them are members of the ICANN Parliamentary Pledge, uh, which is one of our uh, key initiatives on generating legislative support for the treaty, especially in those countries where the governments are ignoring the, the will of the people uh, in support of the treaty. Um, and, and bringing them together in, in Vienna is going to be a big part, a big part of that. And it's also something that, that all of you can have, a, can have a part to play in, in terms of encouraging them to attend and also, um, you know, letting, in, advising them and letting them know about what the people want uh, at the MSP. The ICANN Cities Appeal is, is, also, um, is also a key initiative from ICANN. It's an initiative that pretty much, I mean, cities are the main targets of nuclear weapons. They, want, they would be the ones that would be mainly largely affected uh, by the nuclear weapon by nuclear weapons use and so we have the support of over 300 cities uh, around the world uh, for the ICANN cities appeal which is a commitment to urge the government to support the treaty and take other actions um, which could be relevant such as divestment actions which we've seen most recently with the, the city of, of New York uh, which of course has um, you know, as a massive uh, pension fund and getting that to divest from nuclear weapons is a major uh, indication of support for the uh, for the aims of the treaty and it puts a lot of pressure on the government as well. I'm proud that uh, several cities in Scotland have, have uh, joined the city's appeal uh, as well. So um, the if you want to uh, keep informed about the, the treaty, the MSP itself. I uh, encourage you to sign up for, for ICANN's newsletter and to indicate that you want to receive uh, updates about it. If you're interested in attending um, the Vienna Civil Society Forum, which ICANN will be holding the weekend before, um, please do let us know and, and we'll, add you to the, we'll add you to the list uh, to get information about that. Uh, we want to make this a historic uh, moment, and we can only do that with the work of advocates and activists like, like all of you. Um, so I'm very happy to talk about talk about that and answer any questions you have uh, about ICANN and our work. And I just want to acknowledge again uh, the the statement from Archbishop Nolan, which was very uh, inspiring, um, and and Marianne as well for for inviting me to be part of this, and Callum as well for helping with the with the tech. So thanks. Gosh, that's uh, a huge amount to think about, Daniel. Uh, as an organization, Pax Christi Scotland is very conscious of language. And I think what you said at the beginning about the, the language of nuclear weapons was uh, extremely pertinent. And I hope that we can all keep that in mind uh, as we try to, to move forward and try to campaign. Um, so thank you so much for that. Your advice is, is timely, and we hope that uh, we can live up to ICANN's expectations. But now I'd like to hand over to Callum. Um, Callum Timms is, is uh, Pax Christi Scotland Executive Committee member, as well as being the, the genius behind making all of this work. Uh, so he will host our Q&A session. And I see that there are, in fact, questions already in the, the, the chat box, so keep them coming. Uh, Callum, can you take over, please? Thank you. Thanks, Marian. So we, we do have um, some questions coming in already, and I want to start, perhaps, uh, Archbishop, with a, a question that's close to my heart as well, that's coming from John, and he's asking about education. He's saying that in that 1982 statement, the bishops also required peace education to be an integral part of the curriculum in our schools. 
What progress has been made on that? Well, in actual fact, we're about to, uh, it may have happened yet, I'm not quite sure, but uh, uh, Justin and Peace Scotland are about to send out um, posters to all our schools in Scotland. Um, they sent uh, some out uh, previously, but this, this the, uh, to, uh, the, when I was in Galloway Diocese, they all got them Galloway Diocese, but uh, now we're going to uh, send things out to the whole, to the whole of Scotland um, on, the, on the nuclear weapons issue. Um, I've actually found that uh, talking to, to young people, uh, surprisingly, it, it doesn't seem to, um, you know, be in the public agenda, but, but whenever you mention nuclear weapons to them, you know, uh, they've all got strong views and are very much uh, against them. I found that very, very, very positive, you know. But yes, um, the, we're, we're very keen. Uh, I think the whole of uh, Catholic social teaching is a bit neglected. And uh, certainly Justin Peace is very keen to get into schools and promote all whole Catholic social teaching. But, but we, are, we are dealing with where we are. We are to, want to tackle uh, the nuclear issue as well. That's fantastic and, and a very timely question too. And I totally mm -hmm. agree with what you said, Archbishop. You know, in my own experience as an RE teacher, these issues of justice and peace and Catholic social teaching, they, they really help young people to get involved in the conversation around faith. And they really do open up that, that dialogue. Daniel, perhaps I could turn to you to this next question and it comes from Francis who says that the dangers of nuclear accidents is another reason to oppose them. Here in the UK, nuclear weapons are transported from one end of the country to another on our road networks. So perhaps you could say a bit more about the dangers to host countries from their nuclear deterrence, not just from the weapons sitting in our uh, waters, but also from the transport of them around our roads. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think uh, one thing to remember is that there is so much, I mean, there's so little transparency when it comes to the command and control uh, of nuclear weapons. And I think that's a huge element of why they've been, why, you know, why they have persisted this long and why just deterrence has persisted so long. I mean, there's been many, many reports about this, but there is a, there was a really excellent book from uh, 2014, I think it was, by Eric Schlosser, who was an investigative reporter. It's called Command, Command and Control, and it focuses just on the U.S. Um, the U.S. Command and Control uh, systems, and it revealed, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, accidents, near misses, um, you know, just simple errors that could have had, you know, horrible uh, consequences. Um, that was revealed. I mean, he did it. He found out about it through his own investigation and through Freedom of Information Act uh, requests um, uh, on these things. And there was, you know, ex example. I mean, we've most people are very familiar familiar with the with the kind of the you know the the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Stanislav Petrov um, man who saved the world thing. But there were so many examples that are you know mundane if you think about you know the human element and the and the accident involved, but like the consequences that could have uh, arisen out of it. There was an example of um, a, uh, a plane that uh, the pilot of the plane took off, uh, you know, it was a, it was a bomber. Um, it was a bomber that was, you know, equipped to, to carry nuclear weapons. The pilot of the plane thought that he was carrying a, a plane with, with duds, that it was, it was you know, a, a, a safe plane. Carried it, flew it across the, flew it across the country for 48 hours nobody in the US Air Force was aware uh, or knew where these missing, I think it was about nine nuclear weapons that would, had been transported across the country and they didn't, they couldn't account for them. And they were sitting, they were sitting on a base, on an air base that did not have the requisite like, level of, of security. Not that there is a requisite level, there is a appropriate level of security, but they've been sitting there for 48 hours, you know, unguarded. There was another incident, uh, which, which a bit more well known, um, where um, someone had dropped a special kind of tool, so we can think of it as a, as a spanner or something like that, down a missile silo. It punctured the fuselage of the uh, of the, the petrol uh, tank portion of, a, of an ICBM, led to a fire, created a spark, led to a massive fire, uh, which burned down the entire base. And it was only through one of the last of three fail safe de devices in this uh, intercontinental ballistic missile um, that, pre that prevented, uh, I think it was in North Carolina, prevented a nuclear detonation in, in North Carolina. So I mentioned, of course, these examples are from, are from the United States um, and, you know, the United States, to its credit, I suppose, although that's not the right word, is, is probably the most transparent when it comes to is nuclear weapons. So the, 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 the real fact is that we don't know 
how many accidents and how many near misses there have been in in most nuclear weapon states, and that includes uh, the UK. A lot of these things are, are secret and will be um, for, for generations. On the point about uh, deterrence, um, as the Archbishop said, nuclear weapons create uh, insecurity. Um, they create conflict you know, in, in regions, as we see very clearly in, in the Korean peninsula. Um, but also it makes the country a, a target. Every country that hosts nuclear weapons or has nuclear weapons programs of itself becomes the target of other countries, you know, and probably in the UK's cases, Russia's uh, nuclear weapons, uh, you know, systems themselves, they are actively targeting, they're practicing where to where to aim them, they conduct war games on on, on how to attack other countries with nuclear weapons. So yeah, it's, uh, it's something that not a lot of people, people think about people think of de deterrence being something that is meant to protect, but it, it doesn't, it makes you a threat, it makes you a target, I should say. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, Grace, if I could turn to you for the, the, the next question um, and perhaps take a couple of things together. The first one comes from Hugh, who's asking, is it time for us to do more ecumenically? Is it time for us to work with other Christian denominations more uh, and, and other faiths indeed to create a larger voice in the Scottish family of faiths to oppose nuclear weapons? And perhaps um, at the same time, you could answer Anne's question, which is why do you think the bishops perhaps in England and Wales, were slower to respond than the, the uh, foresight of the Scottish bishops back in 1982. First of all, I'm, I'm actually quite impressed by um, the ecumenical agreement we have on nuclear weapons. You've got the Church of Scotland, you've got the Episcopalians, they're all speaking out about nuclear weapons. Um, so I think that's already happening. Uh, and that's really encouraging because, you know, if, if the, the church speaks, you know, like when the Scottish people say deterrence is immoral and the Pope says, well, it's okay, you know, you, you don't get anywhere with that. And, and I think in Scotland, if, if all the different Christian denominations are speaking with a different voice or saying different things, then the message is very much diluted and ineffective. But in actual fact, the Church of Scotland have been very forceful about nuclear weapons, as has the Episcopalian Church. So, so I think there's, there's been good progress there and we, and we do work together and of course you go to Faz Lane uh, for the, 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 the scanner service normally at Pentecost time, yeah, it's very much a, a, an ecumenical event so I think that's very very positive. Um, I, I don't know enough about the English Bishops Conference to be able to speak about it except of course it's much bigger than the Scottish Bishops Conference and of course that makes it more difficult to kind of get agreement uh, among people and, and I think to some extent perhaps you know bishops reflect the society in which they live so that you've got people there who, who will feel that it's maybe madness to, to give up your weapons because you'll leave yourself open. Um, some worry about the, um, uh, the, uh, um, the, the moral conscience of the, there's actually quite a lot of Catholics working in the nuclear weapons industry um, and that you're going to upset their, 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 the conscience of these people that are, that, are, that are working there and working in the armed forces. Um, so um, I, I don't know because I haven't I haven't asked them. Obviously, when I go to meetings about these things, the ones who come are the ones who, who <laughs> agree. So I'm not dealing with the other ones that, that don't don't agree. But uh, uh, but you know there, there are English bishops who are very who are, are very committed to this issue as well. Um, but I do know they have a, a problem because they're trying to persuade some of, some of their colleagues. But, but those are not the ones. I'm not actually dealing with those colleagues. Um, uh, they are so I can't really comment on them. Thank you. Daniel, perhaps time for just one final question, and that is, do you think there's been a, a, a shift in public opinion? Do you think that when we see things like war and, and you know, the instances in Ukraine and Russia at the moment, do you think that that moves public opinion against nuclear weapons of mass destruction? And is there any evidence to back that up? I think that's that's a really really good question, and it's it's probably a bit too too soon to tell uh, the shift. But but I think what it has done is that it uh, it makes the threat very real for people. Uh, I think nuclear weapons in in previous times are, they're often talked about, um, you know, in in quite abstract terms. Or if you you know if you take a glance on YouTube under nuclear weapons, it's kind of this, you know. Kind of morbid fascination with the with the kind of the mushroom cloud and like the destruction that they could they could wreak and not really in real terms and I think uh, or they're talked about in the context of the you know the possibility of Iran developing nuclear weapons or uh, North Korea and and I think with the with Putin's threat I think people are for the first time since the Cold War probably 
seeing that oh oh my this could actually this could actually happen and so i think i think that is something that it could go you know it, we don't know the shift yet but we have a responsibility to kind of own the shift to to advocate for it and to make it seen for what it is because we're also seeing a massive push for more militarization um my own the country that i'm from uh, sweden uh is currently you know on the back of this crisis has decided to increase its spending up to two percent of, of gdp which is of course the nato stipulated target sweden is not part of it not part of nato uh, and this is kind of you know, this debate is is you know veering towards a very militaristic uh, uh point which is which is obviously extremely extremely concerning as well so it's up to us to kind of advocate um for uh, against that and for the importance of of multilateralism and multilateral diplomatic solutions to crisis uh, but also for nuclear disarmament and with the the meeting of states parties coming up it'll be the first meeting of governments uh, to discuss nuclear weapons since this crisis started so it couldn't come uh, at a better time to raise awareness for the the possible solutions uh, for nuclear threats well, grace daniel thank you very much both for your comments uh, and thank you to everyone who contributed to our conversation in the chat as well. Marion, back over to you. Thank you very much, Callum, and thank you to everyone for their comments and their questions. Um, I think that we have, well, one of the things that um, does strike me as, as it obviously um, a comment there from, from Archbishop Nolan, that when he goes to meetings, um, the people there are, are all on board anyway. And, and I suppose the sad thing about tonight is that um, all of us here, are we're kind of preaching to the converted. Uh, so I do hope that you go out there um, and spread the word of what um, Archbishop Nolan and Daniel have been saying this evening. Um, I'd like to thank both of them, all of you, and... Um, I, I can really find that what, what they've been saying this evening um, just so pertinent and so moving in view of what we're all going through at the moment. So I would like to ask Father John Convery to close our event with a final prayer, bring us all back together again. Um, so over to you, Father John. Thank you, Marion, and thank you to our speakers and everybody who's participated this evening. We are about to celebrate the great Christian feast in a few weeks' time of Easter, a time of new life and the great Christian message of hope. I suppose, as Daniel reminded us during all the talk of despair, maybe, and lack of hope, it's probably up to us to, in some way, in, in the madness that we live in, in some way, present a message of hope that there is another way and that, that way is a way of peace. So it's probably appropriate that we end our, our gathering this evening with a prayer for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia. We pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, for their countries and their leaders, we pray for all those who are afraid that your everlasting arms hold them in this time of great fear. We pray for all those who have the power over life and death, that they will choose for all people life and life in all its fullness. We pray for those who choose war, that they will remember that you direct your people to turn our swords into plowshares and seek for peace. We pray for leaders on the world stage, that they are inspired by the wisdom and courage of Christ. Above all, Lord, today, we pray for peace and for the people of Ukraine. And we ask this in the name of your blessed Son, and Lord have mercy on us all, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Amen. And thank you again, Father John, and to all of you. And I see names that I haven't seen before. If you're not already a member of Pax Christi Scotland, then do go to our website and, uh, and join us with Cheapest Chips. Um, but we would love to, to have you with us. And I hope that um, you'll take away what we've done tonight. And of course, this will be recorded. So, um, you know, spread the word, let, let, the, uh, let everybody else uh, hear all these words of wisdom as well. Thank you so much and good night to you all. Thank you. Thank you.